Welcome to Ace Linguistics. This channel is about all things linguistic, discussing topics in phonetics, phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, and sociolinguistics. So let's see what we've got today. We already discussed that a morpheme consists of one or more phonemes, right? A morpheme may consist of zero syllables such as S in boys or cats, one syllable such as A ah in a moral, two syllables such as lady, three syllables such as crocodile, or even more than three syllables salamander so it's one morpheme it means that the entirety of the word salamander has only one morpheme the whole thing is one semantic unit it's one morpheme okay i also warned you against the confusion that may result like you might say oh some of these words if I analyze them, if I go back in history or into the dark depths of history, etymologically, if I study the history of words, I might see that actually the word salamander, the ER means something or DER means something. The fact that it meant something in a different language or thousands of years ago doesn't mean that it also means that. So that evolution is irrelevant. So you can't do that. So that would be a historical fallacy. So you have to evaluate morphemes in their current status. It means you have to see what they currently mean to the current speakers of the language, regardless of like English, Spanish, Russian, Persian, Japanese, whatever it is. If you're studying the morphemes, they have to be morphemes now. But anyways, despite our best efforts to do this, there will still be cases in which it's not really clear if we have to look at it as one or more morpheme, like counting the morphemes sometimes can be confusing. So again, this is not really relevant, um, but I had to clarify this. But what I want to talk about is we're going to analyze morphemes, but when you want to analyze language morphologically, it would help if you have some insight as to how to conduct the analysis. So I'm going to give you some insight before we engage in morphological analysis. You will be better equipped to conduct morphological analyses. Okay. So there are certain things that you need to know about language that would give you morphological insight before you actually engage in the analysis. So one property of language, which is also relevant to morphology, it was also relevant to phonology is discreteness. What do we mean by discreteness? Okay, maybe I can give you an example from phonology. For example, the sounds. Look, these three are three phonemes in English. They can be combined in this way, but they can also be combined in this way. The fact that they can be combined in different ways shows that there there are components to these words. Those components are words, are sounds, are more phonemes, right? So you can move around the components in different orders and that order is important. Again, I'm going to give you some examples from uh, phonology. Bat. If I say tab, I'm producing a different word. How about Pat. It could be tap or it could be apt. So the fact that we have three, three possibilities shows that these are different components. So the fact that we have different components which are discrete, separate from each other, discreteness is a property of being discrete. Discreteness is a fundamental property of language which makes it possible to form 
to combine all these discrete units in various possible ways. And that is important, not, not just in phonology, but also in morphology. And I will show you how. Discreteness is a fundamental property of language. And by language, I mean the human communication system, the human language. Animals have communication systems, but they don't have language in that sense. But if you want to use the word language liberally and call animal communication systems language as well, then we have to specify we are talking about human language or animal language. But for example, if you look at the word meow, so if you take these as representing the three sounds, the cat has no discrete understanding of the component sounds of meow. Therefore, a cat cannot produce the word omi. If, if a cat was capable of understanding that meow consists of three sounds, then the cat would also be able to produce the word aomi. And then for example, we would say meow, which means I love you, and ow me, which means I need food, <laughs> or you love me. But they don't do that. Why? Because discreteness is not a property of animal communication systems. In all languages, discrete units are combined in a rule-based fashion to form bigger units. Sounds combine into morphemes, morphemes into words, words into phrases and sentences. Okay, this is where I wanted to get to. I had to start with phonemes to get to the entirety of language, which consists of sentences and phrases. So, what we do in language, we have a perception of sounds as discrete sound units. We combine them to form morphemes. Then, we combine morphemes as discrete units of meaning. Then we th when you think morpheme, you don't think sound. So you're moving to the next level. Then you combine morphemes to form words. And then you combine words into phrases and sentences. How is it possible? Linguistic creativity refers to a person's ability to produce and understand an infinite range of sentences and words never before heard. We have a limited number of phonemes, but we have an unlimited number of sentences. And that's how we get there because of all these discrete units at different levels. So in the same way that in phonology, phonemes are discrete units, in morphology, morphemes are discrete units. So the units change from sound to morphemes. And then in words, the morphemes are the units. And in phrases and sentences, the words are the units. So we have different levels of discreteness and we, we can combine these. So the number of possibilities is potentially infinite and potentially that's why we are potentially infinitely creative. That's the exciting thing about language. You can produce an infinite number of ideas and sentences, but it's not that you can just produce. It's like everybody else will understand you. If you, sp if you produce a new sentence, people will understand what the barnacles you're talking about. <laughs> so this implies that we are also potentially capable of understanding words, phrases, or sentences never heard before by breaking them down into their component parts whose meanings we know. This is how we can use an, a finite number of phonemes to create an infinite number of sentences. That is an infinity of meaning. The word undesirable, we know that it consists of un, desire, and able, right? You know that able is a morpheme, desire is a morpheme, and un is a morpheme, but of course there are different kinds of morpheme in the sense that desire is free, un and able are bound. But the important thing is, if I create a new word, for example, utility, right? So I can create an adjective, utilitarian, okay? Then I can create utilitarianism, okay? So you kind of know all of these words. So based on that, if I create the word undesirabilitarian, 
<laughs> and then create the word undesirabilitarianism. So this is just something I just made up right now, right now. But you would, you can make sense of what I'm trying to say, right? Then I can create undesirabilitarianist and then undesirabilitarianistic and then undesirabilitarianistically. Okay. I never saw this word, but I just made it up and it makes sense, right? So how many of these words can we create? Infinite, right? So even the number of words we can create is infinite, let alone the number of phrases and sentences. In morphology, to understand morphemes, we always need to keep an eye on the meaning. So morpheme is meaningful unit. So it has to be a unit. It also has to be meaningful. So those two elements have to exist. Thanks for your time and attention and see you again soon.